Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I like saying, and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Please sit. Well, we do have a spe very special day here at Community Church of the Hills. We have two people who are going to be baptized. We have Branson and Logan. How old are you, Branson? Turning nine tomorrow. Turning nine tomorrow. And Logan? Eleven. Eleven. I think it's awesome that they're going to be baptized under their own volition. Their parents aren't making them do this. And I thought I wanted to give a, a relatively short teaching on what baptism is. I was a baptism at my former church for about 10 years, and I had been wanting to rewrite that teaching for 15 years, and so yesterday gave me that opportunity. And there's a lot of things that I even learned as I was going through this, and I was, I was actually struck with the symbolism I was struck with, once again, for what Christ has done for me. And, you know, I have the greatest job in the world. I get to study God's word for a living and then delivering it to you. So hopefully you'll be blessed as I was as we did this. Um, I thought it would be timely to review of what baptism is because every other week we do do communion here. So we're familiar with what that means. But there's a lot of confusion regarding baptism. And I would even say that most Christians are indifferent to it or worse people who call themselves believers in Jesus may have never been baptized at all according to New Testament baptism so today I want to bring some clarity to that these are symbolic reenactments communion and baptism they're, com they're reactments of the gospel message so that we can better understand and appreciate what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. What did he do? Jesus lived the perfect life. He died for our sins. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he will return again. Those are truths that we need to be reminded of regularly because we, as human beings, forget regularly, do we not? We get distracted regularly. There's so many things pulling for our attention, but only one thing is needed, and that is understanding who Christ is and what he's done. Ordinances are simply visual aids that remind us of these gospel truths over and over again. And as I said before, those are pictures of what Jesus has done through communion and through baptism. Being born again is the starting place before anyone can be baptized. Jesus said this in John 3, 3. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they've been born again. But what does that mean? Well, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin simply means missing the mark. It's a picture of an archer aiming for the perfect bullseye and missing by just so much. And that's what happens when we sin. We want to aim for perfection. God demands perfection, but we can never achieve perfection because we miss not only by that much, but we miss a whole lot, don't we? A whole lot. That's why it's good that we have communion to remind us once again how we need to confess our sins to him. So let me ask you this. Have you sinned? What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. What law is he talking about? John is talking about God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. If you've broken any or all of those commandments, then you are a sinner. And I'm going to take a wild guess here that every one of us have broken every single one of those commandments. How many of you would agree? Not everyone. Okay, let's do that again. How many of you would agree that we'd all have broken at least one commandment? Let me ask you this. Have you ever told a lie? Everyone just say yes. If you don't, you're lying, and so you broke it, and you have to raise your hand, and we have to go through all this again. If you've ever stolen anything, if you've misused God's name, if you've put others before God, if you've worshipped something other than the Lord, put something before Him, if you have 
not taking a day of rest. If you've dishonored your father, how many kids have dishonored their father and mother? How many of you kids have ever said no? Look at mom raising the hand. Oh, they both had to raise their baptismal candidate's hands. <laughs> if you've ever said no once to your parents, then you have dishonored them. How many of you ever murdered anybody? If you did, it's okay. We're glad you're here. We're just going to move away. <laughs> But actually, the standard for murder isn't just the physical act, is it? If you hate somebody, if you hate somebody, if you get angry with your brother, you have committed murder where? In your heart. How many murderers do we have right now in our congregation? Raise your hand. And if you're married, raise both hands. <laughs> we have the seventh commandment now. The seventh commandment is do not commit adultery. But Jesus takes that to a higher level as well, doesn't he? He says, even if you've looked, even if he, usually it's a he, but women too, if you have looked with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery and you've broken that commandment. Eighth commandment is do not steal. Hey, maybe you're not thieves, right? Maybe you think you're not, but have you ever taken too long on a break, right? Cheated a little bit on your taxes? Forget about all the gum and candy and the pennies you stole from your kids when you were in school. No, we're all thieves. And the ninth commandment, of course, we've covered that. Do not lie. But here's the big one. Do not covet. Commandment number 10, do not covet. Have you ever wanted something that wasn't yours? Like the big, a big screen TV like that. Oh, I'm coveting that. When we put it in here, I'm going to come here and watch Netflix. <laughs> no, the bottom line is, if you broke in one of those commandments, then you are guilty. If you are guilty of breaking one commandment, you're a sinner. And if you're a sinner... You're under God's judgment. And God's judgment is this. When you die, you don't go to heaven. You go to hell. All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no adulterer, no murderer can enter the kingdom of heaven. You stand condemned already. It's like we're on death row waiting for that sentence to be carried out. And when is that sentence carried out? When we die. When we die. That's the bad news. We discussed that in the study today and last week. Did we not? The good news only makes sense in light of the bad news. When you know that you are under that death sentence and there's nothing you can do to earn God's favor, that's where the glorious gospel is indeed glorious. Because what did God do? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news. If you repent and turn away from your sin, God forgives you, grants you everlasting life. What a deal. We're only alive here for about 80 or 90 years. I turned 60. I'm dead in 30 years. I'm preparing my girls now to take care of me in my 80s. But then I'm gone. And then another generation raises up. And if we don't tell the next generation what you're hearing today, they're lost. And we live in a country now that is lost. We have a responsibility. But more importantly, you have a responsibility to respond to what you're hearing today. Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to him? Have you been born again? Have you been born again? You got to repent. What is repentance? Repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. When your kids get caught with their hand in the cookie jar or shooting something out of season... And they say, I'm sorry, that's not enough. You want them to repent. You want them to stop. You want them to change their mind and their attitude about sin so that they're going to turn from their sins and turn towards God through Jesus Christ for forgiveness and cleansing. There's a town in a remote par portion of Canada called Wabush, which was completely isolated for a long time. But a road was cut through the wilderness to reach it. Wabush now has one road leading into it and the same road leading out. If someone would travel the unpaved road for six to eight hours to get into Wabush, there is only one way he or she could leave, by turning around. Each of us by birth arrives in a town called Sin. As in Wabush, there's only one way out of it, a road built by God himself. But in order to take that road, one must first turn around. That complete about face is what the Bible calls repentance, and without it, there's no way out of town. 
We are saved by trusting in Jesus Christ demonstrated by repentance. By repentance. Salvation is a gift from God. It's a complete gift by God we receive by faith. We demonstrate, we trust in Jesus Christ by repenting of our sin. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. When you trust Jesus Christ, you are then born again. When you say, yes, I trust you, Jesus, your sins are forgiven, you are cleansed, you have a relationship with him now, and when you die, you go to heaven. There's no lightning bolt that strikes. You don't get a heavenly business card. You take this all by faith. 30 years ago, I was a great sinner. And I think even now I'm a worse sinner because I'm aware of my sin. I heard the good news and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. After that, I got baptized. I got saved December 2nd and I got baptized on January 10th, the following year. And I'm telling you, there's no one worse than me. I am the worst of sinners. Paul did make an error in the Bible. He said he was the worst of sinners. No, I, I beg to differ. Mm, that is next to Tom. I suppose we're all the worst of sinners. So when you trust Jesus and you're born again, the first thing a believer does is to get baptized. Why? Four reasons. Jesus commanded it. Who knows that when Jesus commands something, we should do it. How many know that? How many know that? Not everybody. If Jesus commands something, do it, okay? This brings us back to our original verse. Therefore, go and make disciples, where? Of what, Logan? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the reason to get baptized, to follow the example of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. If Jesus did it, we should do it. Number three, it was the practice of the early church. The Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Peter, after the day of Pente on the day of Pentecost, when he preached this God-spirit-filled sermon, he said, repent and be baptized. You know what the result was? Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Can you imagine? Oh, I dream of the day when I can preach that, and 3,000 come to the Lord, and they all get baptized right away. Not like those great crusades where there's 25,000 people and 10,000 make a profession of Lord to the Lord, and a year later you can find 10 in a church. No, real conversion, real change, because that's what happens when you turn to Jesus Christ. The fourth reason to be baptized, we are now identified with Jesus. Romans 6, or have you forgotten that when we became Christians and were baptized to become one with Christ Jesus, we died with him. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. That's why we're born again. We were born once coming out of our mother's womb. We didn't have a choice. We were raised by the world and its values and we went astray, some of us worse than others. But when we're born again, we learn a new life. We learn a new life directed by the Bible. And my Bible is missing. It's there. Laura, will you toss that to me, please? Thank you. I got the Bible to wave around every now and then to say, this is our authority. This is our life. This is our guidebook. This is Jesus's words. These are God's words. It's so important to listen. It's so important to read it so you'll know what he's saying. So how should we be baptized? How should we be baptized? By full immersion into the water. Why? Three reasons. Baptizo is the Greek word for baptize in the New Testament. It means to dip completely to drown, totally submerging, immersing, dunking into water. Why do you think we do a full immersion? Because it's what the Bible says to do. When I baptize Logan and Branson, we're going to put them under that water, hold them down to the last bubble. And then we're pulling you forward, okay? <laughs> Don't worry, though. Trust God. The noun that is used, that's the verb. The noun that is used is baptismos. In the book of Acts, it refers to a Christian being immersed into water. 
Remember that these ordinances are symbolic of what happened to you in the spiritual realm when you gave yourself to Jesus. You died, you're buried, you come back to new life. That's why the symbolism of baptism by full immersion is so important. Number two, the reason why we do it this way, being totally immersed into the water best illustrates Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and our becoming totally immersed in him. Before you go into the water, when you're standing there in the water, it's symbolic of your old life. When you go down into the water, that's symbolic of you dying. When you're under the water, symbolic of you being buried. When you come back up, symbolic of you being raised to new life. Can you see how that's a beautiful picture of why baptism is by full immersion? Number three, it also illustrates your new life as a Christian. I read this today in my daily reading. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You are brand spanking new. You may not feel new, and there's a lot of old habits that still got to get worn away, and they'll be worn away when you up until you die. You're going to be working on that old nature. It never stops. It's always nagging you. It's always telling you to sin. It's always telling you to do the wrong thing. But the thing is now, because you have put your faith and trust in Christ, you want to live for him. Number four, why you should be baptized by full immersion. Every baptism in the Bible was full immersion. Matthew 3.16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. The implication is what? He went down into the water. He came up out of the water. John the baptized baptized thousands in the Jordan River. Why did he need a river? Because thousands were coming to him. And he baptized them fully in the river. Have you heard of the Ethiopian eunuch? That is this, this man who was on the side of the road and he was, this is a miracle, he was reading his Bible. And then someone comes along and he goes, I go, what are you reading? I don't know, I don't understand it unless someone explains it to me. He explains it to him. Well, let me tell you what the word says. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And after the word of God was explained to the eunuch, he said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Amazing. He read his Bible. He gets saved. And he goes, I need to be baptized. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the spirit and the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. You get saved. You get baptized by full immersion. Now, the Greek word baptizo is never used in the passive sense. What does that mean? Water is never said to be baptized onto someone by sprinkling or by pouring or by putting water on the finger and dabbing it on someone's forehead. That is a completely unbiblical concept made up by man. Believers are always baptized into the water. Only full immersion fits the spiritual reality of what baptism symbolizes. When you sprinkle someone with water, what does that mean? It, it takes away all the, the lofty spiritual symbology that is reenacted in the act of baptism. It takes it away. Not only that, you're disobedient because you haven't been baptized the way Jesus commanded us to be baptized. Only full immersion fits the spiritual reality of what baptism symbolizes. And baptism is for believers only. This is something a believer does when they repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. To baptize infants is unbiblical because infants cannot make a choice to believe until they can understand the gospel message. We call that the age of accountability. No one knows when that age is. It's when your kids can understand the gospel. My daughters, Dee Dee and Laurel, understood the gospel when they were three. I remember my eldest daughter, Dee Dee, got in a big fight with mom. Big knockdown drag. In fact, every fight with Dee Dee was a knockdown drag out fight. But they were driving through the hills after the big fight. And Dee, Dee looked up, and she's three years old, and she looked up, and there was a cross on that hill. And she said this, I am so glad Jesus died for me. 
She understood. Laurel understood when they were little. Do they understand all the theology? And all? No, no, no. But we are to come to Jesus how? As a child. That simple biblical understanding of our needing forgiveness is so simple, a child can understand it. Do you understand that, Sadie? Yes, good. <laughs> Baptism is for believers. To baptize infants is unbiblical because infants cannot make a choice. For those who were baptized as infants, we take the view that the parents have dedicated their children to the Lord as Hannah did when God gave her the child Samuel. We look at that as a baby dedication and we dedicate them because those children are truly God's. I dedicated Laurel, I dedicated Dee Dee to the Lord. They are yours, Lord. You can do with them what they will. Sending them to Texas State was God's will. If you are a biblical Christian, then you want to be baptized the way the Bible teaches, the way Jesus taught, the way the early church practiced it. Infant baptism is not biblical, nor is it New Testament baptism. Reminder, baptism does not save you. How do you get saved? Through Jesus Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. There are some churches that teach baptism saves you. In fact, when I ask people if they are believers, they say, I've been baptized. You know, that doesn't mean anything unless you first profess Jesus Christ as Lord. Then if you've been baptized, then you're just obedient. That's awesome. In obedience to him saving you from hell, we ought to do what he commanded us to do, to be baptized. Would you agree? He saved us from hell. He commanded us to be baptized. We ought to do it. Now, baptism is a symbol, like a wedding ring is a symbol of being married. You wear the wedding ring so other people know you're married. But if you don't wear the wedding ring, are you still married? Yes. It's a symbol of what happened. Yet we are commanded by Jesus to be baptized by full immersion after you are saved. So let me ask you, don't answer out loud. Have you been baptized biblically? If not, you need to be baptized again. Back in the 16th century, there was a group called the Anabaptists. And they went against the Church of England saying, no, you sprinkling and dunking and all of this, uh, not dunk, sprinkling and infant baptism isn't biblical. The Anabaptists, Anna uh, means to do again, to rebaptize. So they were the rebaptists and they experienced great persecution, not only from the Church of England, but from the Presbyterian Church of the time who baptized infants. But they were rebaptizers, the Anabaptists, and they experienced great persecution. The first president of Harvard College, familiar with Harvard? He was a Presbyterian, but as he studied the Bible, he realized their practice of baptizing infants was unbiblical, and he couldn't keep silent about it. They said, you can keep your job if you just shut up about it, baptizing infants, but he wouldn't do it, and he ended up getting fired. He ended up getting fired because he took a stand on believer's baptism. It's a big deal. Pastor John MacArthur gives five reasons why a professing Christian will not be baptized and then we'll get on with our baptism. Reason number one, the person is ignorant because they have not been properly taught. They, don't, they just didn't know. Well, guess what? Today you know. If you didn't know, now you know and there's no excuse. You now know and you do understand what you need to do to be baptized. Second reason why people don't get baptized, pride. It becomes a matter of spiritual pride not to be baptized. The person has gone so long without a proper New Testament baptism that to make a public profession of faith after such a long time of disobedience or ignorance would be a humbling experience. At my other church, we had people who had been Christians for 20, 30, 40 years, and they would say, I need to be baptized. And you know what? No one was... I told you. No, we're like, praise God. You obeyed God. And it was, a great, it was great to see elderly people getting baptized after they professed Christ for 50 years. It was a wonderful occasion. People who don't get baptized out of pride are essentially saying this. They would rather be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ than before the church. 
Reason number three why some people haven't been baptized, indifference. They just can't be bothered. They understand it. They're not against it. They believe in it. It's just not important. It's not a priority. They never get around to it. It's not a major issue. Is it a major issue to be baptized based on what you've heard so far? It is a major issue. It is your first act of obedience when you become a believer. Your first act of obedience. Fourth reason, defiance. They just flatly refuse. They rebel against baptism because they are actively sinning and do not want to publicly acknowledge their submission to the Lordship of Christ and the joy of knowing him when they're harboring sin in their life. Sin will keep you away from being baptized because you don't want to be accused of being a hypocrite. Here's the last reason why people don't get baptized. They're unsaved. They're not really a Christian at all, so there's no moving of the Holy Spirit of God to compel them to obedience. They have no desire to make a public confession and would rather just hang around the church to be thought of as a Christian. They cannot stand up in a public place and affirm the reality of their faith in Christ when he's not a reality to them at all. That makes sense, right? No, if I'm not a Christian, I'm not going to be baptized. Let me say this. If any of y'all today fall into those categories, all you have to do is repent, turn to Christ, and be baptized. Let me say this. Even if you're not prepared, even if all you have on is your street clothes, it is so important for your faith that you say, I'm going to be baptized today and we're going to take you here and we're going to baptize you. We're only going to hold the kids down to the last bubble. We'll give you guys grace. But I'm serious. It's that important. It's that important. This is not some silly ritual. This isn't something you can shrug off. If you feel convicted in your heart today that you have not been baptized by full immersion, as the New Testament commands, I encourage you to come up here after our kids are baptized and be baptized today. What a testimony you will be to your family. When I got baptized, I had to give a little testimony and I remember, I'm not going to tell you, even if you're not prepared and have on street clothes, do it. Perhaps because Americans don't take baptism seriously is why there are so many problems in the church. If people are unfaithful in a direct command from the Lord, repent and be baptized. Perhaps they're unfaithful in other aspects of the Christian life. This is why the church is weak and has no power today. Now that you understand the importance of baptism, do you all understand or do I need to go through it again? Pretty clear? Okay, I think so. And how it's absolutely vital to your Christian life of obedience. Let me give you four reasons why you shouldn't be baptized. Number one, you want to please mom or grandmother or anyone else for that matter. Hey, this is important. Several years ago, I had a mom who wanted me to baptize their son before he went off to college. And I sat down with this young man and I told him, when you go to college, there's going to be lots of temptations, girls, parties. Now you can hang out with girls and go to parties, but are you going to live for Jesus Christ on that college campus? Are you going to live for him? It doesn't mean you're not going to sin, but are you going to live for him? And he goes, give me 24 hours. The next day he called me, and to his credit, he said, I'm not ready to be baptized. I say, praise God, that was a man of integrity. He knew what he wanted to do in college, and it wasn't to live for Jesus. Number two, reason not to get baptized, because a friend or relative is doing it. Number three, you want to become a Christian. You want to become a Christian so you get baptized. No, you don't become a Christian getting baptized. Jesus Christ, you give your life to Jesus, you're a Christian, then you get baptized. Number four, you were a Christian, but you backslidden, and now you want to come back into church, so you want to get baptized. I say no. Why? Did Jesus mean it when you got baptized when you were years ago? Did he mean it? Was Jesus with you? Yes. So you backslid. When you get baptized again, you're saying... He wasn't with you the first time. So I prefer to give people an opportunity to give a testimony of how they live for Jesus, they backslid, and they came back. But if you insist, I'll rebaptize you. Now, rebaptizing you because you were baptized unbiblically is a whole other matter. I'd be happy to do that. And by the way, that's between you and God. I'm not going to be out there as you're leaving, so, huh? No, it's between you and God. It's between you and God. It's my responsibility to tell you what the word of God says and then it's up to you to accept it or reject it I love you anyway I love you anyway 
The only reason to get baptized with full immersion is because you want to be obedient to Christ's command after you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Can I be any more clear? Should we move on? Should I review anything with you? Okay. Well, let's get on with our baptism, okay? But before I do, I want to make an offer to anyone here today. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you do not know for sure that you have given your life to him, today is the day of salvation. Do not wait any longer. You don't have to raise your hand and stand up. I'm not going to make you say anything, but talk to me afterwards. Or maybe think about what I've said and go home tonight and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I believe that Jesus died. He was buried. I put my faith and trust in him. God will save you. Also, if you're convicted that you need to be baptized, I cannot think of a better time than right now, but if you want to wait later, tell me. We're going to go to the Perdinalis River or do it here or your choice. We go to two places. You see in the bulletin, Bill, our friend Bill, who's not here today, he was baptized two years ago in the Perdinalis River right in front of his house. It's a wonderful place, but so is here. Let's pray. And Anis, would you come forward? Uh, this is the time for you to change your clothes. I'm going to go change mine. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I'm thankful, God, for the clear teaching of your word. I pray today as we commit this baptism to you, we would understand fully the significance of this ordinance that you've given to us. We lift up Logan. We lift up Branson. And perhaps anyone else who may want a last-minute baptism that you, God, would be glorified in their lives. Thank you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.